Look at this in Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the number of the years by books. Now, what you're going to find out, and he says it here in the next sentence, Jeremiah. But he's referring to the books of the Bible. I, I knew what the books of God's word said. And he said, which came of the word of Jehovah to Jeremiah the prophet. So we're actually going to go to the book of Jeremiah and show you what he's talking about. But look what he's saying here. I understood the number of years by books from the book of Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. In other words, Jerusalem was going to be uh, taken captive by Babylon and Daniel was in Babylon for 70 years. And Jeremiah talked about this before it ever happened. And so let's read some more. Here's Jeremiah, and here's where Daniel was actually reading when he referred to this in chapter 9. Jeremiah 25 and 11. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So you see the 70 years Daniel referred to? And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I'll punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual de desolations. So he said, once I'm done using Babylon to afflict Jerusalem, because I'll show you why in a moment, their disobedience. Uh, in fact, just pause for a second. It's not commonly known. I didn't know it until I really got into this study several while. But does anybody know why God had Babylon take Israel captive for 70 years? Anybody just happen to know off the cuff? It's kind of embedded in the word, and you don't really hear so much about it. Yeah, exactly. You're getting on to it now. Did we speak about that before, I wonder? <laughs> but yeah, you're on the right track about Sabbath years, and I'll show you the laws of that. <clears throat> we might have alluded to it in a sermon a few years ago or something. But um, notice, when seven years are over, then he was going to punish Babylon. You know, Babylon was wicked as it was, but he still had to deal with Israel and Jerusalem for their disobedience and used Babylon to do so. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 25 now, verse 2. What you're going to see is one of the most awesome, powerful, uh, I, I, I could almost say so accurate, the word of God and how it brings things to pass. And, and you're going to see this tonight through this lesson. In Leviticus 22 and 25 and 2, speak to the sons of Israel, say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to Jehovah. And this is the MKG, so the KJV would say God or the Lord. Uh, how many know what, who or what rests the Sabbath day? According to the Old Covenant. It's people. People rest. But the Sabbath year was land would rest. And just like every seven days man would rest, every seven years the land would rest. And here's how they do it. You shall sow your field six years, and you shall prune your vineyard six years, and gather in the fruit of it, just like a man would work six days. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest to the land, a Sabbath for Jehovah. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. And I want you to notice those two things. You can't sow and no pruning. You just got to let the land go. And in verse 11, that 50th year shall be a jubilee unto you. You shall not sow. Now notice he said every seven years you don't sow. And neither reap that which grows of itself, nor gather in it of your undressed vine. So not only every seven years was a rest for the land, Every 50th year. And by the way, what's 7 times 7? 49, right? So obviously the 49th year is going to be our land of rest. 
but the 50th also. So every 50 years, you had two years in a row that were Sabbath rests. Somebody say double portion. <laughs> Isn't that neat? How many are over 50 here? <laughs> Daniel, I don't think you're here yet. You have not entered yet into that rest. <laughs> but uh, now let's go to Leviticus 26 and 33. And I will scatter you among the nations... Now, what he says here is if you don't make the land rest, if you don't do what the law says, here's what I'm going to do to you. I'll scatter you among the nations, will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be waste and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy its Sabbath. <laughs> I don't know if God meant to have a sense of humor there, but he says if you don't give it rest, I'll make you give it rest. I'll take you captive, I'll scatter you, and then the land's going to rest. As long as it lies waste and you are in your enemy's land, then shall the land rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies waste, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you lived on it. In other words, you didn't obey my law, so I'm going to take you away from it, give the land some rest, and when it gets all its rest, I'll let you go back. Now, go to 2 Chronicles 36 and 20. The ones who had escaped from the sword, he, and this is talking about Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he carried away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. And notice why this happened. This is when God had to do what he warned them he would do if they wouldn't give their land rest. To fulfill the word of Jehovah or the word of God in the mouth of Jeremiah. Remember we read from that in chapter 25? until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. So what you're seeing here is Leviticus said, this is the law, this is what will happen if you don't obey it. Jeremiah said, you've disobeyed the Lord, God's going to take you 70 years. And then Second Chronicles is years after Jeremiah prophesied this, now it's happening. This is what Jeremiah said, it's finally come upon you folks. And until the land enjoys its Sabbath, you're going to be captive all the days of the desolation, it kept the Sabbath to, full, to the full measure of 70 years. So if they were going to be in Babylon 70 years, and it's for every year the land didn't get a rest, how many years, obviously, did they not let it rest? 70 years. But remember how often those Sabbaths come? Every seven years, plus remember the double whammy there? At the seventh seventh, uh, the seventh Sabbath, if a Sabbath every seven years, seven Sabbaths is 49 years, seven sevens. Then the next year was the 50th. So you got to include those two. They obviously didn't let the land rest in the Jubilee year if they didn't let it rest in the normal Sabbath year. This is going to blow your minds. Watch how this happens. Now let's go to Ezekiel 4 and 4. Ezekiel he was around Babylon too during that time. And he is going to show in symbolic numbers of days how many years Israel had to suffer because of their disobedience. So listen to what God tells Ezekiel to do. Lie on your left side. Now picture him physically doing this. Lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. According to the number of days that you shall lie on it, you will bear their iniquity. I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. So shall you bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So a day represents a year here. So he actually had to lay on his side 390 days. God put Ezekiel through some things. Did you ever read that part where he had to have some food that you normally wouldn't want to eat? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Now, everybody say 390. And when you fulfilled them, lie again on your right side, and you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days, a day for a year, a day for a year I have set for you. So say 40. And what was the other one again? 390. And this is 40. That's for Judah, the 40. 390 is for Israel. Remember Judah and Israel were split? So let's look at this. 390 plus 40, 
equals 430 years of iniquity altogether between Judah and Israel. Divide that by seven to see how many Sabbath years are there. 61.4. Now, we're using points or decimals here. Watch how accurate God is. <laughs> Man, I preached this a few years ago down the States, and you should have seen the people get excited at this. How many f years was it till f Jubilee? 50. 49 was the year just before Jubilee. So if we see how many Jubilee years there are, Divide 430 by 50, and you get 8.6. Does anybody know what 61.4 and 8.6 equals? 70. Exactly 70. Now remember, Jeremiah said 70 years you're going to be held captive. And now we're finding out in Ezekiel that all the whole span of years that included the Sabbath years, that included the Jubilee years, was 430 and there's 61.4 Sabbath years in that amount of time, and there's 8.6 Jubilee years in that amount of time. Put them together, and it comes out to exactly 70 years. Now this, this look how accurate God is. For, for something like that to go to the decimal point here and add up to exactly the number Jeremiah said. So you're seeing Ezekiel's numbers and Jeremiah's numbers he that mentioned the 70, Ezekiel mentioned the 430, come together perfectly. Now, go back to Leviticus 26 and 39. They that are left of you shall putrefy in their iniquity in the lands of your enemies. And also they shall putrefy with them in the iniquities of their fathers. If they shall confess their willfulness and the willfulness of their fathers with their sin which they sinned against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me. They'll admit this. I also will walk contrary to them and will bring them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they then pay for their iniquity, that means they go through the number of years they're supposed to go through, and then they, they're humble through it all. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. And also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham, I will remember and I will remember the land. In other words, you're going to come home. I'm going to bring you home. Now, watch what Daniel does. Daniel knows the Bible. He already said, I knew by numbers in the books what Jeremiah said about 70 years. He also knew that Leviticus said, you're going to make the land rest. If you don't rest, I'll make you make it rest. And if you confess, so look what Jer Daniel does. I set my face toward the Lord God to seek by prayer and holy desires with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to Jehovah my God and made my confession. He's doing for all of Israel what God said you must do for me to remember my covenant. Let's get things back the way they should be. And he said, oh Lord, the great and awesome God keeping the covenant. Remember he said, I'll remember my covenant. Daniel knows all of this. He said, so Lord, you keep your covenant and mercy to those who love him and to those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. See, he's repenting. There's two people in the Bible that were called beloved of God. Daniel was one of them because he was actually repenting on behalf of the whole nation. And does anybody know who the other one was? Actually, his name means beloved. John. And John and Daniel both saw prophecy here. <laughs> Isn't this beautiful? He, here he is. We've done wickedly. We have rebelled, even by departing from your commandments and from your judgments. And Daniel 9 and 11, Yea, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside that they might not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse has been poured out on us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses. In other words, this is what we read in Leviticus. It's exactly happened the way you said it would happen if we disobeyed you. We were taken out of the land, and for as many years as we did not keep the Sabbath land, Sabbath rest for the land, that's how long we were in Babylon. When Daniel wrote this, he was, near the, he was about at the end of those 70 years. And that's why he's praying, because he knew. God says, once those years expired, the lands enjoyed its rest, then if you call out to me, 
I'll remember my covenant. So here he's remembering this. All those, remember when Daniel went to Babylon as a child? Him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were kids, and they wouldn't eat the meat of the uh, king? They ate pulse because the meat was offered to idols? And God kept them strong and healthy, and the king couldn't believe it. They're healthier. He said, they must be eating my meat. No, kid, they're not. King, they're not eating your meat. They're only eating pulse. And there's where you get the Daniel diet from. Um, Ever since then, he remembered 70 years. In 70 years, I'm going to call out to God. Wow, what a, talk about a time of waiting. And, what, and of course, God used him so much in between then. But look at verse 24. After all, they're at the, the 70 years now. And then while Daniel's praying and repenting, and, and all he's got in his mind is we're getting out of Babylon now but we've got to do this repentance. We've got to do this confession. God sends an angel to him named Gabriel. And you don't hear much of this taught when people teach prophecy, but isn't it coincidental or is it something more when this angel says 70 not years, 70 not days, 70 weeks are determined, are decreed as to your people, as, as to your holy city, Daniel. To finish the transgression, number one. Watch this. Count this with me. And to make an end of sins, number two. To make atonement for iniquity, three. To bring in everlasting righteousness, four. Seal up the vision and prophecy, five. And anoint the most holy. Daniel wasn't asking about what else is going to happen to us. All he was doing was saying the 70 years are accomplished now. I need to do my part and confess. And God sends an angel and tells him about another 70. And this is one of the most accurate, uh, phenomenally accurate prophecies you'll ever see in the Word of God. We already saw how exact God is with the 70 years amongst the Remember those hundreds that Ezekiel represented and all that divided up into Sabbath years and Jubilee years? How perfect it came out to 70. Now God's taken Daniel even further. And what he's going to tell him here through Gabriel is there's another set of 70 now in the future that Israel's going to experience. And he said, these are 70 weeks. Now what do we think of as a week? Seven days, right? You know the Hebrew... If you were to look up a week in our dictionary, it would say seven days. But in the Hebrew, it doesn't. It, it shouldn't actually say weeks. It should actually say sevens. What, what do they call 12? Is there a word for a set of 12? What's that word? Dozen. What's the word for two, a set of two? Pair. Well, does anybody know what the word for a set of seven is? Probably never heard of this word before. It's a heptad. No one ever uses it. I suppose if bakers were baking sets of sevens and we'd be going to the store for a heptad of donuts or a heptad of bread or something like that. But it's a, a dozen is what we're familiar with. But heptad is just like a dozen or a pair. It's a set of seven and it's not distinctly days. We think of days when we see the word weeks. In fact, some people that think like that Don't even think of, well, what's the Hebrew mean? I know English weeks means seven days, but let's go to what the Hebrew says. And if you go to the Hebrew, it's just sevens. It doesn't say if it's days. It doesn't say if it's years. It doesn't say if it's bread. (laughs) It's just sevens. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. But he says, now there's 70, and the units here are weeks. And they're actually sevens. They're decreed to your people, and it's for your city. So Daniel, now there's something else I need to talk to you about. There's going to be another 70. You're repenting right now for the 70 years you didn't keep Sabbath with your nation. But while you're talking about 70, I'm going to talk to you about another 70. This is what's going to happen in these 70 weeks. The transgression is going to be finished. There's going to be an end of sins. My, oh my, think about this if you're Daniel. You're hearing angel tell you there's another 70 coming up now. And when this 70 expires, there's going to be an end of sins. And it's go, it's, there's going to be a making of atonement for iniquity. There's going to be everlasting righteousness come in. The vision is going to be sealed up. The prophecy sealed up. The anointing of the most holy is going to take place. Now, before we go any further, what's that make you think about? 
Jesus. Amen. See that? How many know when Jesus went to the cross, he took our sins away, right? How many know he made atonement for iniquity? And he brought in everlasting righteousness, did he? What did Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and whose righteousness? His. And if it's God's kingdom he's talking about, and then he says, and his right, obviously it's God's righteousness. How many are glad he brought the righteousness of God? And that's everlasting righteousness. And to seal up the vision and prophecy means to wrap it all up, to seal it up, to just complete it. And, and Jesus Christ is that one. And how many know he is the most holy? The anointing of the most holy would take place. Can you think when Jesus was anointed? What, what scripture did Jesus use the first time he preached? He opened. Uh, it's when he went into the synagogue and he opened the Bible and he read. And he read in, um, let me get Luke. He read in the book of Isaiah. I have it in the notes. It's in Luke 3, 4. Luke 4 and verse 17. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. I thought it was Isaiah. It is Isaiah. It's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now think about everything we've just talked about so far. Think about this 70 weeks coming. And everything that seems to be pointing to Jesus is going to happen in those 70 weeks. Here is the place where he read from. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Now what did it say? The anoint the most holy. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, and number six, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And isn't it interesting, there are six things that would happen in these 70 weeks, and when Jesus opens Isaiah and reads about him being anointed, what the last one says, there's six things he says. And I wonder, and I haven't studied this out yet, but... I kind of looked at it for a little bit. If you compare each one of those six things in Isaiah and in Daniel 9 and 24, I think there's a connection. Somebody say Jesus. And in the Good News Bible, see, I told you I still use some of these versions because it brings it 70 times 70 years. Seven times 70 years is the length of time God set. So there's the 70. And remember I told you weeks is not just a set of seven days. It's just seven. Seven times 70 years is the length of time. What's seven times 70? 490. So now there's a set of 490 years. Another 70. They just got through a 70. Now there's another 70. But it's, it's sets of seven years. And by the way, how, how much was it until the, every Sabbath year? Seven? Every seven years was a Sabbath. Seventy sevens? It's like 70 Sabbaths they're talking about here. Okay, let's, I'm building you up for something here. Daniel 9, 20. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city. Number one, finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Two, make reconciliation. How many know he made reconciliation for iniquity? Three, four, bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision and prophecy. Five, six, anoint the most holy. Know therefore, the next verse, Gabriel's telling them, so Daniel, know therefore and understand. Here's where it's going to start. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now remember, Jerusalem had just been devastated. The temple was, this was the first time the temple was destroyed. Solomon's temple was destroyed. And it's going to be rebuilt. So Daniel, you're at the end of these seven years. I, I hear you praying to me. I hear you confessing. And so this is brought to my mind. And he calls him greatly beloved somewhere in the book of Daniel. And he says, so here we go. When the commandment goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from that point to the Messiah, the prince, how many know his name? There's going to be seven years and Three score and two, seven weeks rather, and three score and two weeks. What's a score? What's three score? 62 plus seven equals what? 
69. So there's going to be 69 weeks until the Messiah comes. See what, how important I told you this prophecy was? When Jesus comes, it'll be 69 of these sevens. So here we go. Look at it carefully. From the commandment to restore Jerusalem, the clock starts counting. And Jerusalem was rebuilt in 49 years. How many weeks did they say? Seven plus 62. The reason he said seven and said plus 62, and he just didn't say 69, was because he divided it. And the first seven years would be how long it actually takes to rebuild the city. 49 years. That's exactly how long it took them to rebuild it. In Nehemiah, you read about them actually rebuilding so 62 weeks after that, which is after that first seven, is 434 more years, and add them together, you get 69, which is 483 years altogether. Okay, now there's still one more week. That's only 69 weeks. There's one more. The street shall be built again. And the wall, even in troublous times, and read Nehemiah and find out how Sanballat was there and he was fighting and mocking them and say to a fox would be able to knock this wall over and trying to discourage them. And here they are building. They had to build with a weapon in one hand and a building tool in the other so they'd be safe and not bothered by these enemies. So in troublous times, it was being built. And after three score and two weeks, so get 62 weeks after that first seven weeks, Messiah is going to be, he's going to come and he's going to be cut off. Everybody say after. After three score and two weeks. So if you've already got the seven weeks when the city's built, which is 49 years, and then an additional 62, bringing us to a total of 69 weeks, after the 69th week, not only is Messiah going to come, but he's going to be cut off. So what number comes after 69? 70. During the 70th week, Messiah was going to be cut off. Now watch this. But not for himself. How many know he did it for us? Aren't you glad he did it for us? So 49 years, 434 more years brings the Messiah. And after the 7 plus the 62, Messiah is cut off. Now, this is, you got to be, every word you have to go carefully by. At the 69th, the end of the 69th, the beginning of the 70th, Messiah's here. But then he says, after the 69th, in the middle of the 70th somewhere, Messiah's cut off. Does anybody know how long Jesus preached? Three and a half years. Now, there's one more week left, and that's seven years. What's seven time, divided by two? Three and a half. In the 69th, in, rather, I'm, I'm sorry, in the 70th, he's going to be cut off. And I just asked you this. So if these were days, and we said after 69 days, Messiah is going to be cut off, so we'd mean during some time during the 70th day, right? And, and what's a day made out of? 24 hours. So which hour would it be? We don't know. Just one of those hours would count as the 70th day, correct? Well... This isn't a day of 24 hours. This is a week of seven years. So sometime in those seven years, Messiah was going to be cut off. And we already know Jesus preached three and a half years. So it's like we're seeing it. It looks like it's in the middle. Okay, let's watch this now. Here we go. Seven plus 60. Don't you like that marble lettering I used? If you look closely, a nice marble black outline. <laughs> seven Plus 62, the 7 is for how long it would take to build the city. 62 from then on till the Messiah, plus one more is 70. And at, in that period, the Messiah comes at the beginning of the 70, but sometime in the middle of those seven years. And so, let's just to re... By the way, if you look at chapter 8, if you look at chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Daniel, he talks about the weeks. So one week is left. The chapter 8, 10, and 11 of Daniel talks about what would happen in those 62 weeks. I don't have time to do that tonight, but between the time that the city was rebuilt until Jesus comes, so 62, what did I say, 483 years? 
That's all covered in chapter 8, 10, and 11 of Daniel. And then the last week left, that's for Jesus' ministry and his work on the cross. So the crucial placement of the 70th week, this is so vital. If the 70th week of Daniel consecutively follows the 69th week, entire interpretation, interpretations of some forms of prophecy are wrong. And Brother McLaren, you, you and I were amongst similar circles, and how many know what I'm talking about when they talk about the 70th week of Daniel by a lot of people is considered still future from our point of view? You ever hear that? 70th week. Well, what I'm trying to show you now is where would that idea come from that you take the first 69 weeks, you've got the seven, that was split up from the 62 to make 69, but how many know there wasn't a gap between the seventh and the 62? It was all consecutive. And then you come to the end of the 69th, and some versions of prophecy that we were taught, I was taught, and it is the popular view right now, I'll tell you that, say, okay, after the 69, we don't know how long, but there's a gap between the 69th week and the 70th. And so far, they'll say, that gap's been 2,000 years. Now, if 490 years are 70 weeks, how many weeks are 2,000 years? But they say, we don't know what this gap will, how long it will be, but there's a gap there and until that last 70th week comes into play when God determines it should come and they talk about when beast and antichrist and all that happens, then you start clocking down the last seven years. Well, I studied this several years ago and I, thought, and I, I heard somebody say to me, you know, Jesus died in the middle of the 70th week? And I said, wait a minute, the 70th week hasn't even happened yet. What are you talking about? And this one guy I was talking with, this was when we were in New Brunswick, he said, Mike, whoever said in the Bible, I know what people said, but where did the Bible say? After the 69 weeks, there's going to be a gap of an untold amount of time, and then the last week. And then I got thinking, I heard, <laughs> I wish I brought it here tonight, but picture a yardstick. How many inches are on a yardstick? 36 inches, right? Say we were talking about 36 instead of 70. There's 36 units. And at the end of the 36, sin is going to be made an end of. Reconciliation for iniquity is going to be an end of. But let's take a saw and cut that last inch off. And let's drill a hole in each of the two pieces of the yardstick now. you got 35 inches and one, the last inch. Put an elastic between those two end pieces. Stretch it. I could have Daniel hold it and me come way back here and say, folks, there's three feet. I could go back ten more feet and say, three feet. <laughs> Why would God say, in 70 weeks, I'm going to do six things? Because he wants us to start clocking those weeks so we know when those six things are going to happen. And then he comes along and says, oh, I forgot to tell you, I put 2,000 more years in there that I didn't, you know, I just slipped them in. Where, why would people think? I, I, I read this as though nobody had taught me anything. And I was reading what Gabriel was saying to Daniel. And he was saying, 70 weeks, this, these three, six things are going to happen. Seven weeks are going to accomplish the building of the city. 62 more weeks is going to bring the Messiah. And after the, 60, second, after the 69th week in the middle of 70, he's gonna be, the Messiah is going to be cut off, the one that came. And then I got thinking now, Something's making a lot more sense to me. Jesus preached exactly three and a half years. And, and so if they were consecutive and there was no gap, and, and he comes at the 70th, he preaches three and a half, he's cut off, but not for himself, and then there's three and a half years left after the cross. Did anyone ever stop to think, who were these 70 weeks for again? Remember, he said they're decreed for who? Jerusalem and your people Israel. Only Israel. So when Jesus comes, how many know he only preached to Israel for three and a half years? 
Because the 70 weeks, are, say there's no gap. This is all one 70 week. It's only for Israel. And then there's three and a half years after the cross, and that is still only for Israel. Think about the book of Acts. Who did he preach to on the day of Pentecost? Jews of Jerusalem. And when did the Gentiles come in? Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Did you know that was three and a half years after the cross? If you check it out. So what makes more sense? No gap. It's consecutive. There, he divided the 62 from the 7 and there was no gap there. And he divided the last week from the other two, and why should there be a gap there? It fits so perfect. Jesus would come, he'd be cut off. And then they say, well, no, the, the one they're talking about that's going to be cut off is, is, is Jesus, but it's not in that 70th week. It's just in that gap. Well, let's just go on. Keep in mind what I've just said. Put yourself in Daniel's shoes. God talks to you about a period of 70 weeks. Six things are going to occur. Would you assume between the last two units of weeks there's going to be thousands of years longer than the whole 70 weeks put together? I mean, it's like this, and then put a gap that stretches from that wall to that wall between the last, and the whole thing was only supposed to be this long. Anyone reading Daniel 9 would never come to the conclusion that there's a gap between the 69th and 70th weeks. You had to have heard somebody say that to you for you to even think of that. Because I, I wouldn't, I heard that taught and I looked at that and said, where'd they get that from? Where did, it's, it's, you read it the way it is. He didn't say there's going to be a gap. He just said there's 70 weeks. And uh, so they say the last one's distinguished from the 62. So there could be a gap there. You got 62 in the... But... The first seven weeks are also distinguished from the next 62 and the last single week. And God never put a gap between those ones. Consistency, thou art a rare jewel. <laughs> so some views, they do insert a gap to have a future seven-year period tribulation. That is the whole reason people say there's a tribulation coming. If you... Take this structure like a house of cards and this one verse in Daniel 9 and 27 and determine if that's consecutive or if there's a gap there. If there's no gap, you pull that out and the whole thing falls down. And I have done enough study to say there was no other reason for people to put a future seven-year... How many know you must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven? That's just tribulation. There's been tribulation every year the church has been in existence. How many have had tribulation? <laughs> We've all had it. And uh, so that we're always going to have tribulation. But when they talk about the certain specific tribulation that's going to be specifically seven years, you actually cannot find a verse in the Bible that says a tribulation lasts seven years. You can't. I challenge you to think about it and look for it because I did. Um, so since the 70 weeks are on Israel, putting the 70th week ahead means God will work once again with Israel, which they claim occurs after the rapture of the church. Now, how many believe there's a rapture? Yes, there's a rapture. Say amen. <laughs> so they, here's what they threw in there. Now, Daniel never said anything about a rapture. He just said there's 70 weeks, but other scriptures talk about the rapture, but not Daniel's nine. And they say, well, there's going to be a rapture, so that must happen here, and there must be a gap there. Well, Daniel didn't say there was a gap, and he didn't say the rapture would be involved with that number he was talking about. But anyway, that's what they say. So 70 weeks are only dealing with Israel. So what makes more sense scripturally? That I'm only going to deal with Israel in these 70 weeks, Daniel. And so there's no gap. Jesus comes. He only preaches to the Jews, because that's the last week, and it's only for Jews. Seven years later, after he comes is when the Gentiles get saved. In the middle of that seven-year period, he dies on the cross. Only Israel was in view here. And then three and a half more years, it's only Jews in Israel. And Samaria is in there too, because they're part Jewish. Does that make more sense? 
Or does it make more sense to say, okay, take that last week, although Daniel never said anything, put 2,000 years before the last week starts, and then he deals with Gentiles, but then he goes back to the Jews for seven more years. Folks, far as I can tell, going back to Israel, it's like making the church a second-rate issue. And I've even heard some of them actually say this, Israel is really his love. We're only in this by his mercy, but Israel is his real love. And after he raptures the church, he's going to go back to his real love, Israel, again. And it makes natural, unregenerated Israel the main issue with God actually accepting animal blood again. And according to what I read in the Bible, Jesus was the last sacrifice. They could offer animals all they want, but God is not wanting it, nor is he expecting them to do it, and nor for sure will he bless them to do it. In fact, after the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, the Bar Kokhba rebellion took place in Israel, and around the second, third century, I'm not sure the exact year, they tried to build the temple again to offer animal sacrifices, to please God again. Did you know that an earthquake took place and they couldn't build it? It's as though God himself said, no, I get rid of that 70 years, A.D. 70, 40 years after the cross. Jesus died around 33, had 40, 40 years or so. I got rid of that, and I'm not going back to it again. Watch this. Christ was offered once for all with no animal blood ever to be recognized by God again. And look at where it says this in Hebrews 10 and 1. The law having a shadow of good things to come. How many are glad we got the good things that were coming? They're come already. And not the very image of those things. The law can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually. You know, he's almost talking in disdain about those sacrifices. I'm mean, glad our sacrifice was a good one, but those ones from the old covenant, they can never take away sin and make the comers there unto perfect. For then, if those sacrifices could make people perfect, would they not have ceased to be offered? Why offer them if the people are perfect? So it could never make us perfect. Because the worshipers once purged, somebody say once, not a million times, <laughs> once. Once you're purged, you should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's that attitude again, there is a remembrance made of sins every year. When they thought a sacrifice, folks, they, man, God's giving me a sermon here right now. When they thought of sacrifices, they thought of sin. But our sacrifice, we don't think of sin. We think of freedom and sinlessness and liberty, hallelujah, getting set free and delivered. Every year it made them think of sin. But what does our sacrifice make us think of? Notice he says, the law can never make the comers thereunto perfect. Say it with me. The law can never make the comers thereunto perfect. Watch this. With those sacrifices, they would have been ceased to be offered. And look what verse... 10 says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering, verse 14 says, he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. What's it say here? It could never make the comers thereunto perfect, but we are made perfect. He is perfected forever by one offering. And verse 17, and their sins, this is what our covenant, this is what our sacrifice did. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In those sacrifices, there's what? A remembrance of sin. In ours, there's no remembrance. Now where remission of these is, see, if you say I'll never remember your sins anymore, they're remitted. And if you get remission of sins, there's no more offering for sin. So when they say temple's going to be rebuilt, God's going to want them to build it in Israel. He's going to want them to sacrifice again. And I'm, God's waiting for them to build that temple. He's waiting for them to offer. And when they offer that sacrifice, then God's going to start the clock ticking again. I don't believe that at all. I believe the clock stopped forever. Hallelujah. Because Jesus died once and for all. And he will never again look at animal blood. Ever, ever again. How many know law was animal sacrifices? And the Bible says the law was an enmity 
between Israel and the Gentiles. And God destroyed the wall. He took the enmity away so Gentiles could join Israelites and all of us be people of God. How many know that the Bible says, if we build again the things that we destroy, what do we make ourselves? Transgressors. Well, God took away the wall of law. If these folks are right, and God's going to turn back to the law again, and he's going to turn back to temples and animal sacrifice, he's going to build something he destroyed. And if he tells us, if you build the things that you've destroyed, you make yourself a transgressor, I don't think God's going to break his own rule that he expects of us and make himself a transgressor. He said no more offering for sin. And you might say, well, they kept on offering. Mike, they kept on offering after the cross. Yeah, but God wasn't recognizing it. He was gone from that temple. I'm glad we're sanctified by the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And by one offering, he perfected us forever. We don't need another sacrifice. There's no more offering for sin. And I'm going to bring this down now. So now let's go back to Daniel 9 and 27. Here is the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th. One week left. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. I was taught he is Antichrist. But I'm having a wondering if that's actually Jesus. Jesus, everybody, what, what would he do to the covenant with many? He would confirm it. Not create it. He would confirm it. Now, what's popularly taught is the Antichrist is going to create a covenant with Israel for seven years. They don't know what else to make of that because there's got to be a separation and blah, blah, blah. Well, it didn't say create. It said confirm. And did you know the New Testament actually says Jesus confirmed the Abrahamic covenant? It actually says it. In chapter 10, verse 1, 2, remember what the law did? If a sacrifice could make the offer a perfect, sacrifice would cease to be offered. Isn't that what verse 27 said in Daniel 9? He's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. How many believe Jesus caused sacrifices to cease? That's exactly what Daniel 9 and 27 said would happen. If you mix up the he and you think it's someone else, then it's like, oh, the Antichrist is going to let them offer sacrifice and he's going to stop them three and a half years later. And he's going to break the covenant. And, but what about what the New Testament says? Because it's saying words almost identical to what you read in Daniel 9. He'll cause the sacrifice to cease. And he says, those sacrifices in the Old Covenant could never make them perfect or else would they not have what? Ceased. The same word he's using. Like this was blowing my mind when I was seeing. When, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is when you think of Jesus and you think of the cross and focus everything on him, on the cross, the cross, the cross. Genesis to Revelation points to the cross. From Genesis to the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, it's pointing to the cross. From Matthew to Revelation, it's pointing back to the cross. It's all the cross. And I get looking at this as talking about the cross, and Hebrews 10 started coming to me. I mean, I was writing so fast, I said, God, slow down, slow down, I can't keep up with you. <laughs> it's like, and then he said, look at the words even there, cease, cease. So this is Jesus in verse 27. And so Hebrews 10 and 14, I'm so glad that we all can say, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Somebody say, focus on the cross. Hallelujah. And let me close with this illustration. If your monthly bank payment and period is over and you keep on making payments, your payments are made in vain, right? But the bank's loving it. <laughs> if they're honest enough, and I think bank, my bank will do that, uh, you get some extra money here. I'm going to give back to you. <laughs> but God's demand for those sacrifices was fulfilled with Christ's sacrifice. And Jerusalem continued to offer in vain. See, one, one person told me, well, Mike, if you're right, if sacrifices ceased, then how come they didn't cease? How come they kept on offering? They kept on offering. They didn't cease. It's not what they might do that God's talking about. It's from his perspective. Are they required or not anymore? You can offer all you want. 
just like if you keep throwing money away, they'll take it. <laughs> but as far as God's demands are concerned, they ceased by the cross of Jesus. Hallelujah. How many believe Jesus paid it all? And how many really believe the last words he said on that cross? It's finished. <laughs> and what happened when he said that? He died. The veil ripped in the temple as to say, I'm done with this mess. Praise God. Oh, let's thank God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise